Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Why am I playing gladiator music? That's Dennis Prager's music. Well, I'm bogarting Dennis's music because Judge Amul Kapar, in his brand new and terrific book, The People's Justice, cites that Judith French, counsel in the Cleveland Vouchers case, used to get psyched up using this music. Good morning, Judge. Welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I can. It's great to see you. Welcome. Glad you could do the video, Judge. Judge, I want to begin by telling people a little bit about you if they don't know much about you. You've been shortlisted for the Supreme Court twice. You're still a young man. I expect that to happen again. Born in Michigan, and your father wisely moved you to Ohio at a young age. Uh, I hope you grew up cheering for the Buckeyes and the Browns. Is that the case, Judge? You know, I, I'm not anti-Browns like you are anti-Bengals, but Joe Burrow and the Bengals living down by Cincinnati, it doesn't get much better than that. And so when the Bengals are out of it, I cheer for the Browns. I like them much better than those teams out east. And the Cardiac kids were fun to watch as a kid and Brian Sype and Bernie Kosar. But the Bengals are at least making it to the Super Bowl, Hugh. And oh, well. this year we get to open and close with you. That's half a wrong answer, but let me press you, because Urban Meyer's listening right now, uh, Judge. Were you a Buckeyes fan? Because you went to the Ohio State Law School for one year, then you transferred out to Bolt. Are you a Buckeyes fan, or did you root for that team up north? You know, my dad's a Michigan guy. I started with Michigan, but once, but once I went to Columbus, it, it's infectious. And okay. I had a great year in Columbus, and now down you know, close to Ohio, it's hard to root for Michigan now. Okay, good, good, good. So, All right, so you've repented. Oh, so that's half a correct answer. We'll go forward from there. I want people to know you, you were appointed to the district court by President Bush in 2007. You went on to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals as President Trump's first nominee in 2017. You are the first federal circuit court of South Asian descent. I, however, want people to know mostly you're a fine writer in your opinions. And I didn't expect this book. I think I wrote you when I first got the review copy. I thought you wanted to be on the Supreme Court someday. Is it smart for judges to write books at all? Don't you want to hide? Probably not, Hugh. But, you know, it was just too good a topic to put down. And Justice Scalia always said that we have an obligation to fly the flag. No one in the academy is teaching originalism. No one outside is teaching originalism. And I thought it important to take the next step. Justice Scalia was so good at uh, getting law students and lawyers to understand originalism. I thought it was more important for me to get the American public to understand originalism. I've always prided myself on writing so that everyday people can understand and not trying to hide behind legal ease. And I thought I could do that. And then once I started studying Justice Thomas's opinions, it just flowed. It was easy. He made it easy. Yeah, it grabbed me right away. I've told the judge this. I want to tell the audience. I have blurbed hundreds of books in my 33 years of broadcast and 25 years of con law teaching. But I've never sent a blurb as long as I sent for this one because I couldn't pick anything. But if I had to get down to one graph, it would be your summary of originalism, which is, quote, originalists believe that the American people, not nine unelected justices, judges, are the sources of the law that govern us through the Constitution and the statutes enacted by our elected representatives. The judge's role is to determine what the words of those documents meant when they were enacted and to apply them to the cases in front of him or her. Nothing more, nothing less. Page 21 of the foreword. I, you know, there are lots of schools of originalism, but they all have that in common, don't they, Judge? Yes, they do. And there's, there's a lot of schools, as you mentioned, but I think they all come, da- come back to one common theme. We're trying to figure out what the American people blessed in the document, what the American people allowed the courts to do and allowed more, as importantly, the other branches to do. Now, uh, Justice Thomas is the uh, longest standing originalist on the court because he's been there since 1991. In that time, he's issued 85 four decisions. You didn't necessarily go for the five four decisions in which he issued the majority opinion. You looked through the whole corpus. Why the whole corpus? Because there are dissents in here, which we'll talk about, I'd never heard of before. Yeah, I thought what was really important is the dissents. He can talk about what he believes. In other words, when you're doing a majority opinion, you have to reach consensus. And as you and I both know, there haven't been always five originalists on the court. And so you're going to find his 
brand of originalism in his separate writings. And his separate writings and his originalism not only capture the original meaning of the document, but they show that all the criticisms of originalism are just wrong. Um, they've said they, it favors the rich over the poor. The book proves the opposite. It's true. It's, they say it favors corporations over consumers. The book, again, proves the opposite is true. And so and it's not me telling you. A lot of times critics want to tell you what Justice Thomas thinks. I let his own words do this talking and the cases do the talking. Only the intro and conclusion are mine. Everything in between are the cases. And as you write in the introduction, the heroes of this book are, quote, the parties, lawyers and witnesses, many of whom agree graciously agreed to interviews. That's why I like this book. That's why I will teach this book in my con law class. Probably is the first thing they have to read because they, they've been in, in law school for a year. So they know the legalese. Before we drive into it, I use Randy Barnett and Josh Blackman's book. So it's an originalist book, uh, case book. But actually understanding the case does not come from case books. I'm sure you've discovered that, right? You lecture often at law schools. Case books obscure the reality of cases. Your book makes front and center the parties, their lawyers, and the setting. I, I salute you for that. Yeah, I think when we get into higher courts, we often forget there's real people involved in these cases. And hopefully, Justice Thomas never forgets that, as this book proves. That's why he is the people's justice. He remembers in every case there's real people. And even as we'll discuss, or maybe we won't, but I'll mention two years after a case is over for Kathy McKee trying to get uh, her name repaired against Bill Cosby, Justice Thomas remembered her in a different separate writing. So he doesn't forget about the real people that come before the court. Now, do you think he has been attacked because of his jurisprudence? I, I think he was attacked originally because of it by Anita Hill and the, the campaign to smear and destroy him. But subsequent, the Harlan Crow stuff is just nonsense, in my humble opinion, because I know what the rules are. What do you think? Why does he attract all the lightning? Is it his jurisprudence or is it his person? I think it's a combination of the two. I think his jurisprudence is so powerful that it's capturing people that actually give it an honest shake. That's why the publisher put in this in the cover that even the critics might be surprised by their answer if they'll read this and take a genuine look. The other thing that this captures and is that his side of the story is never told. And I think the critics are afraid that if books like this tell what he actually says in his opinions versus what they want to put on him, that the American people will see firsthand that he is the people's justice and understand why he is the people's justice. And I think the final thing is his personality, as you mentioned. If you meet him, He's so fun loving. He's just an everyday American. He's not an elitist as um, many of us are tagged with. And Justice Thomas just isn't that. And the American people would love him. I've been to events where he stays after everyone has left and thanks every one of the people that served the meal, that cooked the meal. He goes around and takes pictures with him. Getting him out of events is impossible because he just wants to thank everyone. I've seen that at Chapman Law School, by the way. But I, I was talking about your book over the weekend with a fellow by the name of Dick Hauser, who is ought to be behind bars because he steals strokes from people. But he was deputy counsel in the White House when I served under President Reagan. And Dick knew Justice Thomas when he was at the Department of Education. I worked with him at the EEOC when he was chairman of EEOC and I was running the OPM. But I never I've only talked to him once since then. I don't know him well and don't pretend to. I think I know him much better after reading this book because I've never much paid attention to dissents. There's so much to take in. The only dissent I've actually taught is the McDonald dissent, or the McDonald concurrence, separate opinion. And we'll come back to that. But the dissent in Kilo, I never paid much attention to because I, I did private property uh, law and Fifth Amendment law for 30 years. I know all about condemnation. You you open the book with Kilo. And let's talk about that before the first break. Why did you choose Kilo to open the book? Because I think that dissent, I tried to research it. And like you don't talk about it, no one reported on it. And he is the only justice in that case that adopted the original meaning and went for the original meaning of public use. And we can get into the details on the other side. But 
the one thing I want to point out is only one amicus asked him to take on the original meaning, and it was the NAACP. Where is that reported? N nor does anyone report all the damning statistics, and I'm sorry to use that word, that he includes in his dissent about how eminent domain, a concept where the government can take your property for public use, it's supposed to be, preys on minorities. And he points out that the predecessor case to Kilo, 97% of the people that were displaced were black. Yeah, the, the great quote that from that dissent is urban renewal means meant Negro removal. And you quote Justice Thomas saying that. What I liked, especially about this, having dealt with condemnation and public use abuse for 30 years, they never offer you fair price. They never do. And they didn't to Kilo, as was eventually admitted. They always lowball you. So you're screwed from the beginning. They can deposit that amount of money and say, sue us. That is so far removed from what the framers intended, Judge, that they knew public use had to come. I mean, they had to build roads and bridges in the Erie Canal, but they never imagined robbing people or abusing them with this process. And they certainly didn't intend with the 14th Amendment that it be applied to the freedmen. Yeah, that's right. And what an, if I may t just talk about Suzette Kilo for a second, what an amazing woman. And I yes. think this book captures her resolve. Her resolve is incredible, and the amount of time and effort she put into a house, and then the government wants to take it away from her. Blood, sweat, and tears, as I say in the book. And it goes through her struggles and the threat of having her house bulldozed and others' houses bulldozed. And the stories captured there where they sleep in the house to stop the government from bulldozing it down the night before a court hearing. And the key thing... The key thing, the villains in this, which are the Redevelopment Authority of New London and Pfizer, never build a thing. They destroy all these lives, they cause all this litigation, and they never do anything. I'm coming right back with Judge Thapar. The book is The People's Justice. We're going to cover five of 12 chapters. We just covered Kilo. I have four others picked out. We can't do all 12. We're not going to give the whole book away, but go order The People's Justice. It drops tomorrow. It'll be on your doorstep in the morning. Go to Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, or your local bookstore. Get the People's Justice, and I'll be right back with Judge Thapar after these messages. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Judge Amul Thapar is my guest. He is a judge of the Sixth Circuit of the United States, the most important circuit because it covers Ohio. He's also the author of this brand new book, The People's Justice, which should be a bestseller. I want to emphasize one thing. You don't need to be a lawyer. You certainly don't need to be a con law professor or a constitutional litigator. It is explanatory about everything that goes on at the court and how the cases develop. And I appreciate that, Judge, so much. I'm going to go to the most surprising case. I've got five to talk about. One down, Kilo, three in the after show, which I'll play tomorrow morning. And then Jane Doe versus the United States. I was stunned by this because it's not a case. It's a denial of cert. And uh, a denial of cert, if everyone knows every denial of cert, I don't know how you even found this. Tell people about the case that involves West Point, which I also did not know is the oldest uh, U.S. military installation in the United States, and Jane Doe's trial and her tribulation there and what Justice Thomas wanted to do. Because the Ferris Doctrine is not easy to understand, but you explained it quite well. Well, thank you. So the Ferris Doctrine isn't easy to understand. Um, and I'll leave in the book why... West Point is the oldest, but it should be older. People have to get the book to find out why and what happened between Washington and Jefferson. But moving forward, there's something called the Federal Tort Claims Act, which allows people to sue the government. So the sovereign was once immune. And as the government became more involved in the people's lives, the people demanded that they be able to sue the government when the government wrongs them. Uh, and what started to happen is people wanted to sue the military. Well, you don't want soldiers to be able to sue their bosses for orders and things where they may get hurt. And so there were exceptions to being allowed to sue. And what that meant, what they tried to capture is things incident to your service, which meant related to your service is a better way of explaining it. And so Jane Doe, who's attending West Point, tragically and sadly gets raped. And after her rape, she wants to sue West Point for their negligence in allowing the rape to occur. 
but the courts have to throw it out because of the language incident to the service. And Justice Thomas says, whoa, 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 we've gotten way away from what the American people meant when they created the Federal Tort Claims Act and the exceptions to the Federal Tort Claims Act. And I think we would all be surprised, and he finishes with this nugget, to find out that Jane Doe's rape was incident to her service. Yeah. And he's yeah. the one... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, he is the single person on the court, which is a conservative court in 2021. It is the new court. But he's the only one who is willing to take on the scope. Now, we are not going to say that Jane Doe had a claim. We don't know. We don't know if she got right. We don't know anything. But we know that she doesn't get into the courtroom door because of the Ferris Doctrine, and the court doesn't want to open the door to justice. At least look at something that is 70 years old, 73 years old, and in fact became expanded, what, in 83? It got bigger. Uh, do you think that's ever going to, by the way, make its way to the court's docket if it's an 8-1 shutdown in 2021? I do. I mean, Justice Thomas points out how someone had surgery and a towel was left inside of them that was like property of the U.S. military and they weren't allowed to sue. And I think at some point, judges are going to start writing and saying, this is ridiculous. Either Congress needs to revisit it or the court needs to revisit it. And that's a lot of what we do in the lower courts is often we'll write separately and we have to follow the law, but we'll say someone needs to look at this again. You know, judge, once that starts- Do you think that that the the dissent here, it comes in a denial of cert. Would you explain why, I, I don't even know how you keep track of this stuff. How does a denial of cert differ and how did you find this? Because it's a very illuminating chapter in your book, The People's Justice, and it demonstrates depth and breadth of research effort here. Yeah, I think denial of cert, so every day or every Monday or Tuesday, depending on the week, the court will deny cert because they get over 8,000 cases a year. And as I have said, and as I'm sure you've told your listeners, they take between 80 and 100 cases. And so they issue these one line orders. But if you read through those and see, there are sometimes the justices will write separately. And they're hard to find, as you mentioned. And if you go Google this case and Google Justice Thomas, you won't find any reporting on it, surprisingly. I think because, again, I mean, you can form your own conclusions, but it's it, do the, they want the American people to know that Justice Thomas is the one justice that wrote about this? You know, I, think I think it breaks the image of the caricature. I think if Justice Sotomayor or Justice Kagan had written the denial of cert, we'd all know about Jane Doe. Justice Thomas wrote the denial of cert, so only Judge the Par knows and tells me and puts it in his chapter in his book. We're going to come back after the break and continue to talk with Judge the Par about three more cases out of the That'll make a total of five out of the 12. The People's Justice is available now. It's in bookstores everywhere. It is the second best book about Justice Thomas. The best being his autobiography, My Grandfather's Son. But this is about his jurisprudence, and that wasn't. So I urge you to go and get it. If you got a gift card for Father's Day yesterday, go out and get this book, The People's Justice, and come back for more of Judge Thapar and me talking about the people's justice right after this. Joined now by Judge Amul Tapar for a continuing conversation. I began it on Monday. I put it on the podcast. I'm playing some of it on Tuesday morning because it's so important that people get the people's justice, which is released today. Zelman v. Simmons-Harris is the next case I want to do. It's an Ohio case, so it matters. More importantly, it's the first major breakthrough for vouchers. And vouchers will save America if anything does. And Justice Thomas is writing here, but he's writing concurring in the, in the majority decision. Would you set up, and by the way, this is one of those great chapters where you explain everything about the case, why the Ohio Attorney General Montgomery took it, why uh, assigned to Judith French, a Youngstown area attorney, how it gets up there. I love all that background. Judith French preparing with the gladiator in the background. I love all that stuff. Give us the rundown on the case, Cleveland, George Voinovich, and Justice Thomas's concurrence. Yeah. So as uh, Hugh just pointed out, of course, it comes of Cleveland. So it's one of Hugh's favorites. It does not talk about the resurgence of the Browns. It talks about the resurgence of the city of Cleveland when George Voinovich becomes mayor. And 
Hugh and I both are old enough to remember that resurgence when Cleveland was once called the mistake on the lake. And I think if I remember correctly, Hugh, Sports Illustrated had a picture of the lake on fire. And well, I talked Cuyahoga about that River, a bit Judge. Before. Just want to correct the river. Cuyahoga. It was the Cuyahoga River, not yeah. the lake. Yeah, because the rake actually extends, of course, to Toledo and Buffalo, two other great American cities. <laughs> and so you don't want to throw those in with Cleveland there. But um, Voinovich comes in and he really revitalizes the city and turns the city around. And it, it's really remarkable. Cleveland now, I think, is a wonderful city and people should go there, not cheer on the Browns or go for the Bengals game and cheer on the Bengals. But uh, after... <laughs> After the resurgence, he becomes governor, and he knows he left one thing behind, and that was the public schools. He never could break in and change the public schools. So he goes to the Republican speaker, Bill Batchelder, and says, I need a voucher program, and I need it to be constitutional, but the only way we're going to fix the public schools is through competition. we got to make them compete. And so we need a voucher program that will let kids go to any school. And I want it to be for underprivileged kids. I don't want it to be for everyone. we got to start with the underprivileged kids because those are the schools that are failing. And the schools were in tragic disrepair. I mean, 25, 14 to 25 buildings had been condemned, and yet they had not shut them down. The kids didn't have toilet paper or soap in their schools. Uh, I mean, just basic necessities were lacking in these public schools. And so Batchelder goes to Cleveland and he meets with the city council and he finds two remarkable allies. One is Bill Patman, who moved from Detroit and became a city councilman because he saw what was going on in Cleveland. The other is this amazing woman named Fanny Lewis, who I fell in love with when I researched her. She was from the worst part of Cleveland. And they have this great saying I include in the book about her, and I tell all about her, but they have this saying, she got to know everyone in her ward. And they said, no, she's the safest person walking the streets of Cleveland, because if anyone jumps her, she'll call their mom, because she knows everyone. (laughs) And so Fannie Lewis and Bill Patman team up with Bill Batchelder. The Democratic leader teams up, and he has some choice words for those that oppose vouchers that are included in the book. And this case eventually gets the voucher program starts and stops multiple times. And imagine the kids who have the opportunity go to these schools and are having and I include some of this in the book and quotes about what the parents thought of this program. And there's a picture on the Twitter page that was set up for this book of the Cleveland parents at the Supreme Court. Yep. And and. It's an incredible picture. It just captures what the parents think of this program, who it benefits, and it gets to the Supreme Court. And luckily, the Supreme Court upholds the program and it allows kids to succeed. And their success rate is included in the book and shows kids just need an opportunity and they will succeed. And we need to give them that opportunity. And the key in Cleveland was vouchers to giving them that opportunity. And it was constitutional. And if I can get to Justice Thomas, he points out it once among many things, Justice Thomas points out that it's so ironic that what he calls the cognoscenti, which means the elitists, don't want kids to have vouchers. And yet they want to approve other programs that he views as unconstitutional. And that doesn't fix the problem. It puts a Band-Aid on it, as he says. You know, I, I love that Doug Ducey, friend of the show, friend of mine, said about universal vouchers in Arizona that for 100 years, racists stood at the school door and wouldn't let black children in. Now they won't let them out, even though whether it's in Cleveland or in Compton and everywhere in between, inner city schools have failed terribly. And you write out that uh, Justice Thomas He did the majority, but Justice Thomas, uh, Rehnquist did the majority, but Justice Thomas fully concurred, and he wrote, quoting Frederick Douglass, that uh, uh, urban children have been forced into a system that continually fails them. And we've got to break that door. I think this was the first breakout, and now there have been subsequent. He wrote the, uh, the opinion in Good News himself, the majority opinion, but he continues to be a force majeure for freedom for kids and for parental rights, which I'm going to come to when we get to uh, uh, to the last case, entertainment merchants. But 
it is an astonishing consistency in every chapter that he is focused on the people who are hurt by the system being uh, litigated over or who have benefited by the change being denied. Can I add one more thing? Please. When he quotes Frederick Douglass, he quotes these words, education means emancipation. He will often quote Frederick Douglass, which will also surprise many people as to how often he quotes Frederick Douglass, but education means emancipation. Why were those words so important to him? Because as recounted in my grandfather's son, he grew up on a dirt floor, dirt poor. And his grandfather viewed education as emancipation. And so his grandfather, who was not well off, saved every penny to send a young Clarence Thomas to a Catholic school where he was influenced and where he got his education. And he views those as the most important and most formative years of his life. And if we, we all know in America that education is critical and between kindergarten and eighth grade, there's no more important time to setting kids up for success. And the Cleveland schools were failing and the statistics are damning at the time. And these kids and their parents just wanted an opportunity for them to get out and go to the school of their choice. Cleveland, the state of Ohio set up an amazing program. And remember, one thing I didn't mention is the schools were in such disrepair that a federal judge intervened and it signed the superintendent of Ohio to take over the Cleveland schools. And so the solution was going to be denied until the court stepped in. I love this concurrence. You know, um, I also love Judith French. You went and found a first-time advocate before SCOTUS. Now, whenever I've been asked, on a few occasions when I've been asked, who do you think I should get to get this case? I always say Paul Clement. Uh, because it's the easiest thing and I can't go wrong. And if you're going to bet the farm in your business, go get Paul Clement. What do you think of having a rookie go before the nine judge? Because uh, obviously Judith French put her soul into this and she won. So it doesn't mean you're going to lose. But I think if you're going before the, the nine... Even if you're going to the circuit, you'd better be very sure you don't want to send a rookie at bat, right? What do you think about that? Well, this case proves that wrong. I think if you go listen to Judith French's argument, and I recommend the readers go listen to it. In fact, I'll make sure they put it up on the Twitter page, oh, The smart. People's Justice. I hope they'll and put up the link to the argument, because if you go listen to Judy French argue this case, you will see how amazing her argument is, so much so that when she was doing her moots with Ken Starr, the famed advocate at the time, he and people wanted him to argue, he said, no, you've got the right woman. And afterwards, he said, I couldn't have done it better. There is no chance. That's really her remarkable. Her argument was remarkable. Uh, yeah, Judge Starr was a good friend of mine until his death, and I, I didn't know that story. I, that's why I like this. But uh, Things like Doe, things like that. Uh, let me move now to the penultimate case we're going to cover. And for the benefit of the Bengals fans, that doesn't mean the best. It means second to last. That's McDonald versus City of Chicago. And this is a 2010 case. I want everyone to know I teach this case every year, the Thomas Concurrent, because there's a very thorny thing for law students called uh, what happened in the Slaughterhouse cases or why don't we apply the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment and instead use this, this incorporation thing? I don't know if you want to tackle that, Judge, but you did a fine job. That's why I want my law students to read this, because I it will save me three days of teaching Slaughterhouse and Incorporation, which is very hard, but I want the reader to know you get it. But I teach it because, in one opinion, Justice Thomas explains what went wrong and why he wants to go back to the Privileges or Immunities Clause. You want to take a swing at this and tell us about Otis McDonald along the way? Because it takes him six brushes with criminality before he even thinks about buying a handgun. Yeah. So he, Otis McDonald moves to Chicago for a better life, right? And he's a veteran. He goes into the military, he comes out of the military on the GI Bill. He uses the money to go to school and work at the same time so he can give his kids an easier life than he himself had. And Otis and he gets married, has kids. They moved to Morgan Park in the south side of Chicago, 
what once was a wonderful community, hopefully still is a wonderful community. But as the, the crime problem grows in Chicago, the crime goes out into Morgan Park, drug dealers, everything, violence, and people start breaking into his home. First, he puts up bars. You've recounted six times. He puts up bars to try and stop them. He then puts in an alarm system to try and stop them. He get, joins community groups to try and stop them. He leads community groups to try and stop them. And the book recounts everything, including his brushes with gangs. And then what happens when his neighbor luckily calls the police when someone is under a car in his garage, hiding under a car, had broken in and was coming into the house. And he finally says enough is enough. The only the police aren't going to get there soon enough. And he thought very highly of the police, but they just weren't going to make it there quick enough. If someone was inside his house, he was adamant that he was going to protect his wife and kids. All of his kids, by the way, became successful on their, in their own right. Um, he needed a handgun. He needed a gun by his bed in case someone broke in, because by the time the police got there, it would be too late. Can I interrupt you for a second, Judge? One of the elegant parts of the people's justice is that you recount each of his incidents with lawbreakers, and you discuss how neighborhood kids would break into his house. And I think it's important to realize that the choice to buy a handgun here is predicated only on a half dozen brushes that might have cost he or his family their lives. So he is a reluctant gun purchaser, but Chicago doesn't care what your record is. Go ahead, Judge. Yeah, and what happens next is he, he's denied the right to possess a gun. Here's a veteran who knew how to use guns. He hunted some in his free time, and not that he had a lot, but when he did, and yet Chicago wouldn't let him have it. So he wanted to challenge the gun laws of Chicago, yet... Heller hadn't been announced. And so, the, and I won't go through that, but the book recounts the interesting story of how he got teamed up with Alan Gura and how he had to wait and he wasn't happy waiting. And he has this nephew who's a lawyer who really does a great job counseling Otis and teaching him, be patient. And you know what Otis does? He reads all the decisions. Yeah. He, he goes through and reads all these decisions and he learns about the privileges or immunities clause. And what it learns is that 15 minutes after Heller has decided they file. I love that. I didn't know that. 15 minutes after yeah. it comes down, they file McDonald. Go ahead. Tell him about this nightmare of yeah. law. Well, Otis wasn't going to be patient, Hugh. Otis yeah. was ready for it to be filed and wanted it to be filed. But the privileges or immunities clause, and the book recounts it, and I don't want to give away too much, but it recounts the Crookshank and the slaughterhouse, all that, what went on. And I think the reader, I want to save this nugget, Hugh, so people go out and get the people's justice and read it, because I think it will educate and uh, hopefully, um, yeah, and I think people will really enjoy the read, but uh, how the Crookshank, how the Privileges or Immunities Clause was put in the 14th Amendment to protect blacks. Why? Because after the Civil War, what were passed were black codes in the South to deny black people guns. And that was the ability to protect themselves. And here was the grandson of slaves, Otis McDonald, trying to rectify that the Privileges or Immunities Clause, which was supposed to allow blacks to participate in equal footing and give them the privileges or immunities of the United States, which included their gun rights, was, had been eradicated by the Supreme Court, had been I, written out of the Constitution. I want people to read it so they get that background. You know, it is as relevant. Tomorrow, Vivek Ramaswamy is on, and Vivek attempted to educate a television host on how the black codes prevented blacks from having firearms, and the television host wasn't having anything of being shown up by a, a young man who actually knew what he was talking about. And if that television host had read The People's Justice, they would not have embarrassed themselves and they would still have their job. I don't expect you to comment on that, Judge. Uh, that's why I'm bringing it up. I just want people to understand that this debate about the black codes and blacks having guns is fully and carefully explicated by Judge Thapar in The People's Justice. I want to finish, Judge, and honor your time and my audience's time with his dissent, Justice Thomas's dissent in Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association. I bring this up, and again, I'm not asking you to comment 
on cases that might come before the court involving parental choice. I bring it up because parental choice on matters of sexual dysphoria, et cetera, is, and school is everywhere in the news every day. And parental rights is everywhere in the news every day. Justice Thomas weighed in on the originalist view of parental rights. You are not adopting this view, but you are relaying it. Now tell us about Brown v. Entertainment Merchants Association, because I honestly had never read his dissent until I read The People's Justice. Yeah, so um, can I comment on Vivek? Because yes. he is from Cincinnati, you know. So you're having back-to-back days. Yeah, he's wrong, fans. too, about football. I, yes, I know. We've done that before. The poor man raised in the wrong place. Can't help. But go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, so back to Brown. Brown was a case where violent video games were posing a problem, and the people of California wanted to give, especially single parents, the right to veto their child's purchases of video games. And so what California did, and it was a bipartisan effort, they teamed up and they passed a law that allowed, that all it did is required before a child could buy a violent video game, meaning someone under 18, they had to get their parents' permission. Kind of like going into an R movie or anything like that. Or getting a tattoo. For a long time. I'm sorry. Getting a tattoo requires usually parental consent if you're under 18. Getting married, going into the army, all kinds of things require parental consent. That's all this was, was parental consent law. Well, immediately the Video Game Association challenged it. And a district judge, the book recounts the story of the lead up to the Supreme Court. So I'll skip to the Supreme Court, but it's really fascinating. And it's really fascinating who was watching video games and what they were doing. I recount at the beginning of the book, uh, the beginning of the chapter, the Columbine case, uh, the horrific case out of Colorado and how the the two uh, evil devil's children went in and shot up that school, but were playing a video game and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And Justice Thomas takes a look at the original Constitution and what happened at the founding and what parental rights were. And he recounts in detail, and it's not only worth reading the book, but it's worth then after you have a flavor and read all that to go pick up his dissent. Because while I try and capture what he was doing, it's detailed. And he provides a thorough history of parental rights there and points out that at the founding, you didn't have a right to speak to someone's child. Your right to free speech and the video game maker's right to free speech may exist, but they don't have a right to speak to your seven-year-old without your permission. In fact, as the chapter recounts, parents were very involved in education and all sorts of things with their children. And even what was taught in the schools was run through the parents in some sense. Think of uh, the boards over schools that are usually uh, manned and womaned by parents. And so if you look at the history, there was no question that Justice Thomas was right about parental rights. Interestingly, the court split not a, a long typical lines there. Justice Breyer had a really thoughtful dissent. And I Pragmatic as always, book, right? He, Pragmatic Justice Breyer. He, But here's what we had. We had a teaming up of pragmatism and an appendix, right? Justice Thomas isn't the only one who includes appendixes. Justice Breyer put an appendix in. A different chapter has Justice Thomas putting an appendix in with a picture. And I'll leave that for them to get the book and read it. But uh, this one, Justice Breyer includes an appendix with all the articles and studies showing what violent video games does to kids. And so the one-two punch of Breyer and Thomas is pretty compelling. On on parents' rights, it's dispositive, I think, on video game. Judge, I want to conclude. I've got a colleague on Chapman's faculty, James Phillips, who is one of the leading large language model originalists. They are now putting everything that was written before the Constitution was uh, ratified during it, and then everything before each of the amendments into bases. They're using large language models and AI to determine. What do you make of that approach generally, not specifically, because James has persuaded me it's legit. Now, he's brilliant, and I don't ever want him to leave Chapman, but he's going to end up being on the bench somewhere. What do you think of large language models trying to get to the originalism at the time, the public meaning at the time of adoption of the Constitution or a statute? 
You know, I think anything that can help us, I think they're all tools that can help judges and others and lawyers and even lay people figure out the original meaning of the Constitution. I'm more than willing to look at anything that is included to help me figure it out, as I think Justice Thomas is as he goes through in that chapter about parental rights. Oh. He goes through all kinds of sources that existed at the founding. And so I think it's really important that judges be open to help in any way to figure out the original meaning of the Constitution so that we can get it right. Let me quote from that chapter. You quote Justice Thomas saying, it would be absurd, he said, to think founders guaranteed a right to speak to a minor without parents' consent. Quote, the founding generation believed parents had absolute authority over their minor children. That's on page 172. That is a, that's a defense of parental consent law. Now, that's not Judge Thapar's opinion, that's Justice Thomas's opinion, but I think it can't not, it, it, it's not actually up for debate. That's what they believed. It may have been modified in various places over the years that you would have to account for, but he begins with what the public meaning was at the time of the adoption of the Constitution. I think it's persuasive, and it, my, my bottom line, Judd, I think he scares people because as a dissenter, he's taken over the Scalia job of changing the law 30 years from now, not tomorrow. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, Justice Thomas is always willing to say, here's the path we have to follow to get back to the original meaning. And a lot of people that criticize him don't realize he's not saying that doesn't mean if it's not found in the Constitution, you don't have it. In fact, Justice Thomas believes we retain all of our rights except those that were specifically given up in signing the document and allowing the government to regulate us. And what's more, he thinks states can do all sorts of things. And the legislature, if they properly do it through bicameralism and presentment, Congress signs it and the president doesn't veto it. It can become law as long as it complies with the Interstate Commerce Clause. But check out Chapter 4 about his view on that. Oh, I, I love Chapter 4 because I hate teaching the Dormant Commerce Clause as well. Judge, you've been very generous with your time. I want to ask you one personal question. You obviously love to write and to think and to debate, and you're a public intellectual. But I've always told people I could never have been on the bench because I couldn't yammer all day long. How much of an imposition is it on, on Amul Thapar not to talk politics? Uh, it's it's a big imposition, but I you know we talk at lunchtime with my law clerks. It's always fun. We can banter about anything as long as they don't attack the Bengals. They're fine, and they can attack any of my views, and we can debate them. And it, it's a ton of fun. But I like staying out of the political realm to some extent because it gives me freedom to do all these other things. Well, I want to congratulate you on a fabulous book, The People's Justice. By the way, you're not going to find many blurbs that include. Attorney General Meese, Attorney General Barr, Molly Hemingway, Laura Ingram, Megyn Kelly. This is really remarkable number of blurbs, and they love the book. And congratulations, Judge. I know you probably have a tough media schedule in the next few days. Good luck in walking the tightrope between talking about the law and not talking about politics. You did it very well today. Congratulations on the people's justice. I hope to see you again. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thanks for having me on. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Judge.